All right, today we are in part three of our message series called Be My Witnesses. And I'm super excited about this series. I'm excited about this series because it's not about us. It's, it's not about you. It's not about me. It's not even about our church. It's about others. You see, the irony of life is that the more we focus on ourselves, the more we focus on our needs, the more we focus on our own happiness, the less happy we are. Right? But on the other hand, the more we focus on others, the more we focus on helping others, the more we focus on blessing others, the more we focus on lifting others up, the more we focus on supporting others, the happier we become. That's just the, the way life is. That's just the way we're wired, right? So, so when you focus on adding value to other people, when you focus on lifting others up, you become more valuable. That's just the way it is. And that is what this series is about. It's, it's all about helping others find hope. It's all about helping others find community. It's all about helping others find God's purpose for their lives. Because when we do that, then we're blessed. Jesus, Jesus said that we're more, it's more blessed to give than to receive. And the foundation scripture for this series is from Acts chapter number 1, verse number 8, where Jesus said to his disciples, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be what? My witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Two Sundays from now, Christians all over the world are going to celebrate the fact that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. It's called Easter. Come on, somebody. And how many know that that's a big deal? Easter is a big deal. I call it the Super Bowl of Christianity. And the reason why Easter is a big deal, the reason why uh, Easter is a big deal is because of the resurrection. Jesus resurrected. And by his resurrection... He defeated death, he defeated hell, he defeated sin, he defeated Satan. Come on, somebody. Not just for himself, but watch this, for all of us. Who loves that? Amen. 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 He defeated, he defeated darkness for all of us. So without the resurrection, there would be no salvation of humanity. If Jesus had not come out of the grave, then Christianity would be no different than all other religions. That's why the resurrection is a big deal. But how many know that as powerful and as consequential as the res resurrection of Jesus is, it would do no good if people didn't know about it. If you didn't know about the resurrection, it would do you no good. Okay? And people wouldn't know about it unless the people who know about it love them enough to tell them about it. In fact, there's a scripture in the Bible that says that. Paul, the apostle, the great apostle, he said it this way in Romans chapter 10, verse number 14. He said, but how can they... They talk about people who don't know God, people who haven't heard about God, people who are not in God's family. How can they call on him, Jesus, to save them unless they believe what? In him. We got saved because we called on Jesus. We got saved because we believed in Jesus. And Paul says, how are others going to call on the, on the Lord and be saved? And how can they believe in him if they never heard about him. Don't you just love that? And then he goes on. Here's the part that really, really, really catches my attention. And how can they hear unless what? Someone tells them. So, the message of Jesus, the good news, is any good news is no good news if it is not news. Good news is no good news if no one shares it. If you don't hear good news, then to you, it's no news at all. 
Are you with me this morning? So that's why the message of Jesus had to be passed on. <clears throat> somebody had to tell somebody. Who told somebody? Who told somebody? Who told somebody? Who told you? Come on. And now the baton has been passed on to us. It's now our turn to be witnesses and to tell somebody about this good news. Okay. So that's what this series is all about. That's why I'm excited about this series because this is how we get to bless other people. This is how, how we get to connect people to hope. We get to connect people to Christ. So on week one of the series, we looked at Jesus' mission on earth and the work that Jesus came to do and, the, and how, how uh, Luke says in Acts chapter 1 that the work that Jesus de- began to do, he began to do it. In other words, Jesus is still doing his work today, but he's doing it through his followers. So we are the hands and feet of Jesus to continue the mission that Jesus came on earth to do. And then last week, which was week two, I shared with you that one of the easiest ways to invite people to Christ is to invite them to the church. Because in the atmosphere of the church, in the atmosphere of worship, in the atmosphere of a clear teaching, a clear presentation of the gospel, the Holy Spirit can move on someone's heart and help them make a commitment to Christ, help them say yes to Jesus. So so inviting people to church is really the first step or a ramp to inviting them to Christ. And also, we learned last week that sometimes we have to go beyond just inviting people to doing what? To bringing people, actually bringing people. This morning, we're going to continue on part three, and we want to talk about the Jesus method. The Jesus method. So question, what is the Jesus method? You know, uh, I, I discovered that uh, there is a ma- there's a method to the madness, right? I, I, if you look at Scripture, you see that. So, so what's, that, what's that method? Now, before we answer that question, let's start first by defining what a method is. What's a method? A method is simply a process or a procedure for attaining something, for accomplishing a goal. Everybody has a method. You, you have a method. You may not realize it, but you have a method. Every day when you wake up in the morning, you follow a method. When you drive, you follow a method. When you read through the Gospels, you can't help but notice that Jesus had a method. He had a method for ministering to people, had a method for reaching people. When you, when you look at the way Jesus operated from day to day, it may seem like no two days was exactly the same. It may seem chaotic. It may seem very erratic. But there's a particular they, uh, but there's a particular method, there's a particular way in which Jesus dealt with people. And this morning, what I want to do is just take one of these examples in Scripture and just kind of go over it together so that we can learn the Jesus method. So I selected a, a, an encounter that Jesus had with a man in Luke chapter 19. We're going we're gonna to look at it together. In Luke chapter 19, starting from verse 1, here's what the Bible says here. It says, Jesus entered Jericho. And was passing through. Passing through. A man was there by name, uh, by the name of Zacchaeus. Now, if I'm, uh, if I'm pronouncing that wrongly, just, just forgive me. Blame it on my accent, right? But, but a man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. And he was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. I highlighted the chief tax collector and wealthy. Because there's a reason why the Bible is telling us those details. See, generally at that time, tax collectors were not viewed very favorably. In fact, they were regarded as the worst of worst sinners. Most of them were indeed corrupt, and so people hated them. You see, tax collectors uh, were Jews. They were Jews. But they were working for the Romans. So by that, that by itself made them traitors because the Romans were foreigners who came to occupy the land of the Jews. And people resented the fact that they had to pay taxes to Rome. They had to pay taxes to foreigners. They didn't want to do that, right? Not only do they, were they paying taxes to foreigners, but they were paying taxes to foreigners that persecuted them 
and mistreated them. And the way the system was set up was that the Romans selected or hired Jewish people to go among their people to collect taxes. And there, were no, there, were, there was no fixed income or salary or wage that was paid to tax collectors. The arrangement was something like this. You collect taxes for Rome, and whatever else you can collect above that, you can keep it. Now, can you see how that can be abused? I mean, there would be no limit to what you can collect. Because you just collect as much as you want to. Okay? And, and many tax collectors abuse that system by taking far too much from the people and thereby amassing wealth to themselves. And the religious leaders of the time just really hated that. They despised tax collectors. And they considered them unclean. In fact, they considered them unredeemable because they were so dishonest. Their testimonies wouldn't even count in a court of law. That's how bad it was. That's how bad it was. Now keep in mind, keep all of that in mind as we examine Jesus' encounter with this man who is considered an outcast, who is considered the worst of all sinners. So Jesus was going through Jericho, and then this man named Zacchaeus, who was a wealthy tax collector, came into the picture of the story. So let's move on to verse, the next verse. It says, he, Zacchaeus, wanted to see who Jesus was, but he was short. And uh, because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. You know, there are people today who uh, want to know who Jesus is. They genuinely want to know who Jesus is. They've heard about Jesus, especially in this time of the year where we talk about the resurrection, we talk about Jesus, we talk about the faith. There are people who genuinely want to know who Jesus is, but they are hindered by one thing or the other. Some are hindered because of a bad experience that they had with someone from the church. They want to know who Jesus is, but, but a bad experience is kind of putting a sour taste in their mouth. Some people are hindered by the church, by what they see in the church. That's why, by the way, friends, we've got to be careful. We've always got to be careful because you don't know who is looking at you. You don't know who is watching you, right? We've got to be careful. You could put a barrier, you could put a block in someone's path from following Jesus. In the case of Zacchaeus, it wasn't a person. It was his own stature. There are many people today who may want to know Jesus, but they have no one to invite them. No one has ever invited them to Christ. No one has ever told them about the gospel. So in verse 4, it says, because he couldn't see over the crowd, he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree. Look at that. In order to see Jesus, since Jesus was coming that way got to realize that this brother was determined. you got to realize that Zacchaeus was motivated. He, he was motivated in order to do what he did here. Because think about this. How undignifying it must have been for a wealthy man like Zacchaeus to run ahead and climb a tree. How many wealthy men do you know who would climb a tree just to catch a glimpse of somebody. <laughs> are, are you with me this morning? But, but this man was really wanted to see Jesus. You know, the, the hunger to see Jesus was far greater than the desire to maintain a social status. And I think that should be encouraging to somebody in this room this morning who is looking for God. If you came here looking for God, I, I, I can promise you, you're not going to be disappointed. Yeah, you're not going to be disappointed. I can assure you that. Now, if you came here looking for a good orator, somebody who can really talk, if you came here looking for somebody who has some fancy language and elaborate vocabulary, yeah, you, you're going to be disappointed. Okay? But if you're looking for God, you're not going to be disappointed because God always reveals himself to people who earnestly seek him. In fact, here is a promise. Here is a promise that God makes in Jeremiah 29, verse 13. Watch this. It says, if you look for me, how? 
Come on, church, help me preach this morning. How? Wholeheartedly, what will happen? You may find me. You perhaps may find me. You sometimes will find me. No, 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 no. What is it? You will find me. Boy, that's so encouraging. I don't care who rejects me. I don't care how bad my situation is. I don't care how many times I've failed. All I want to do is just seek God wholeheartedly. Because with all my faults and with all my issues, if I seek him wholeheartedly, there's an assurance that I will what? I'll find him. That should bless somebody this morning. I'm telling you. I'm telling you, I don't care who has disqualified you. If you seek God wholeheartedly, if you came here looking for God, you're not going to be disappointed. You're going to find him. God is not far from you. He is not hiding from you. He wants to be found by you. But the only condition is you've got to be hungry for him. When, when you want God more than you want anything else, that's when you find him. But when you treat God as one of your options, that's when you can't find him. He has to be your only option. And Zacchaeus demonstrated that. Zacchaeus went out of his way to do something very undignifying by climbing up a tree just to catch a glimpse of Jesus. And we continue. When Jesus reached the spot, didn't I tell you that if you sought him wholeheartedly, that you will find him? When Jesus reached the spot, look what happened. He didn't walk by. He looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. He got more than he bargained for. He only wanted to see Jesus, but now he gets to host Jesus. How many want to host Jesus? In your come on. Now, pull out your worship guide, because that brings me to the first point that I want to share with you today about the Jesus method. Here's point number one. Recognize when God is working in a person's life. Why did Jesus stop when he got to that spot? Because Jesus recognized something. Everybody else was on the ground following Jesus. Everybody else was around, surrounding Jesus. There was only one man who climbed a tree. It had to mean something. It had to mean that he desperately wanted an encounter with Jesus. And when Jesus saw that, he couldn't just walk by. He stopped. He looked at him, and he spoke to him. You know, I've come to discover that if we want to be witnesses for Jesus, we've got to, we've got to learn to recognize when God is working in a person's life. Well, Pastor Manny, isn't God always walking in a person's life? Yeah, God is always walking in a person's life. Just like we say, God is everywhere, right? The presence of God is everywhere. But there are some places where the presence of God is especially there. So, for instance, the presence of God is in a club. The presence of God is in, at the stadium where people are playing sports. But the presence of God is also in the church. And we know there's a difference, right? There is the general presence, but then there's the special presence. So God is always walking in people's lives, but there are times and moments when God is doing something special. Something special in a person's life. And you've got to learn to recognize that. Okay? And friends, this is probably the single most important step in being a witness for Jesus. This is more important than almost anything else you do because if you sow the right seed in the wrong ground, you won't get a harvest. Right? You've got to learn to recognize the moment when God is doing something so you can step in with God and go with God. One day, while, I was living in, while we were living in Baltimore, I went to uh, the bank. Still remember? It was the Bank of America. Went to a local branch of the Bank of America to deposit a check. And uh, when I walked in, there was a line. So I got in line waiting for my turn, and then I, I just I realized I didn't really have time to be on the line. And so I began to calculate in my head, should I leave and just come back another day, another time, or should I wait? And so I decided, okay, I'll just wait and see how fast this line goes. And thankfully, line didn't take too long. It was my turn. And uh, I stepped up. I, we exchanged greetings, quick greetings with the teller, 
and I handed her my check. And then I asked her, how are you doing? I was expecting the usual, oh, I'm fine, and you? But that's not what I got. When I said, how are you doing today? She just began to tell me about her life. She just began telling me about, you know, all the things that was going on in her marriage with her children and, and all of that. And then in my mind, I thought, oh, no, oh, no, oh, no. This is not the time. I'm in a hurry. Anybody ever been there before? Okay, I'm the only Jew in, I'm the only Jew in Jerusalem. That's fine. That's fine. I'm the only, I'm the only sinner here. That's fine. So, so watch. I thought to myself, no, I don't have time for this. And she kept going on. And it was then that the Holy Spirit caught my attention in my heart. Because, you see, that morning, I had prayed, Lord, use me today to be a blessing to somebody. And as I was standing there being agitated about the fact that I was in a hurry, I remembered that prayer. The Holy Spirit reminded me of that prayer. And so here's what I did. I had my keys and my phone and my wallet in my hands. And when the Holy Spirit reminded me of that, I just laid them down. And I took a deep breath. And I said, okay, Holy Spirit, let's go. And I let her talk. And when she finished, I asked her, I said, so why are you telling me all this? I'm a stranger. You've never met me before. She looked up to me and said, I don't even know. And I said to her, I think I do. She's like, you do? You could see that that caught her attention. She said, why? I said, I think you're telling me this because maybe God wants me to pray with you. She's like, yeah. And so I began to encourage her. I gave her some scriptures to encourage her about what she just told me. And then um, I prayed for her. I was no longer in a hurry. And even though there were people waiting for me, I took a quick minute and prayed with her. And after I prayed with her, she said to me, so where do you go to church? And I told her about our church. And uh, guess what? The very next Sunday, she and her husband and her children were in church. In, in fact, her husband became the very first drummer that we had in our church at the time. Yeah. Her husband gave her life to Christ, and they got baptized in the church. But you know, I almost missed that moment. I almost missed that moment. The truth is, um, we're not always attentive to recognize when God is working in a person's heart. We're not, we're not attentive to it. And so God may be working all week, all month, all day in a person's heart. And he brings us at that time, come on, to finish it up. He brings, it, brings us to encounter the person so we can hit a home run. So we can, we can close the deal as it were. But we're not attentive. We think, I'm in a hurry. I don't have time for this. I don't know why you're doing this. You see, people are looking for God but they don't always look for God by carrying a sign and say, I'm looking for God. People are hungry for God, but they don't always go asking, how can I find God? Sometimes they ask different questions. Sometimes they ask questions like, I don't know what to do with my life. I don't know what to believe. When people say things like that, you've got to recognize what they're really saying. You've got to be attentive to the moment. Jesus saw a man on a tree, but to Jesus, it was more than just a man on a tree. Here's the truth. This week, no doubt about what I'm about to say now, this week, you are going to encounter people whose heart God has been preparing all along and he's just hoping that you can close the deal. That you can point them to the cross. He's just trusting you, especially now that you've got this teaching, because that's how it works. God will never put you in a situation that he has not prepared you for. He's going to put you in a situation where you only have to say to someone, Jesus is the answer. So that's the first point that I want to talk about this morning. That God is doing a work in the hearts of people and we are his co-workers. And we are to finish the deal. Look at verse 8, at verse 6, I beg your pardon. Um, I don't have that scripture. Okay, in verse, in verse 6 to 7, it says, So Zacchaeus came down at once 
and he welcomed Jesus gladly. Right? He welcomed Jesus gladly. And all the people saw this, and they began to mutter. This is religious people responding now. Okay? And what did they say? He's gone to be a guest of a sinner. I'm going to ask you a question, church. Was it true that Zacchaeus was a sinner? Yes. yes. Was it true that Jesus uh, went in his home to be his guest? Yes. yes. So guess what? Guilty as charged. Jesus is a friend of sinners. Wow. He is. He is. And that makes me glad. Because, see... I was once a sinner. On my own, I'm still a sinner. But in Christ, I'm no longer a sinner. I am now a sinner saved by his grace. Who says amen to that? And so that brings me to the second point that I want to share about the Jesus method. And that is, Jesus accepted people unconditionally. He accepted Zacchaeus. The religious people thought Zacchaeus was not worth a penny. I mean, they wouldn't even touch him with a nine... A nine-foot pole. But Jesus went to his home and sat with him and had dinner with him. All right? So let's be honest. This can be hard to do because we have been conditioned to evaluate people. Whenever you meet somebody for the first time, you are unconsciously kind of psyching them there up. Right? You're, you're kind of classifying them. You're, you're looking at them in different lights and trying to assess them. And most of the time, we evaluate people based on external things, things that have nothing to do with their heart or their character. You know, in psychology, that is called implicit bias, right? You see someone who's from a different culture, and in your head, you summarize how you think they are because of where they come from even without hearing a single word out of their mouth. And if our goal is to be like Jesus, then friends, we've got to learn to love people who are different than we are. We've got to learn to love people who, who, who come from a different background. Watch this, because when you think about Jesus, people who were nothing like Jesus liked Jesus, and Jesus liked them too. Can I hear an amen on that? People who were nothing like Jesus. They loved to hang out with Jesus. And Jesus hung out with them. Let's go to verse number 8. I hope I have it here. I don't. Okay. So in verse number 8, um, it says, But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give, all, I give half of my possession to the poor. And if I have cheated anyone out of anything, I will pay back four times them out. Look at that. Look at that. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. And in verse number 10, Jesus said, for the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. Friends, take note of the change in Zacchaeus' life. Take note. This man got up and said, I'm, I'm, I'm making restitution. Without a sermon from Jesus, but simply by being in the company of Jesus, Zacchaeus had a change of heart and began making restitution, began fixing what he might have done wrong. Man, powerful. That brings me to our third and last point this morning, and that is simply this. Never underestimate the power of hospitality. Hospitality is the act of turning strangers into friends. A conversation can do what a sermon cannot do. Did you hear what I said? I'm going to say it again because I want you to get it. A conversation can do what a sermon cannot do. We are so eager to preach to people. Maybe we should just have a conversation with people. Instead of preaching to people... Maybe we should invite them for dinner. Hospitality. Instead of passing out tracts, maybe we should ask them how they're doing first. Okay? Instead of, instead of some corny religious slogans like, Jesus loves you. Hmm. 
let's show them we care. There's a pastor in Los Angeles. His name is Pastor Rick Wilkerson. He said something so powerful. He said, if you care about someone's eternity, show, by, show it by taking care of their reality. Isn't that powerful? Now, for the last few weeks, I have challenged us to make a list of people that you want to invite for Easter. Uh, why invite them for Easter? Because people uh, are more likely to accept an invitation to church during Easter. I've asked you to pray for the names that are on your list. And today, I want to challenge you. I know it's a challenge. I want to challenge you a little bit to go the extra mile and extend hospitality to the people on your list. So, so here's what I mean by that. Invite someone to your home this week. If you can't invite them to your home, how about inviting them out for coffee? If you can't invite them for coffee, do something else. But all I'm saying is extend some type of hospitality to someone who is a stranger to you this week. Just as a step, your first step to turning them into a friend. Invite someone who looks different than you. Maybe a different skin color. Maybe a different culture. Maybe a different mindset. Different beliefs. Invite them. Extend hospitality to them. And then you personally invite them to Easter. Of course, I know you can't invite everybody to your home. That's fine. There are some people that you can invite over the phone. And by all means, do that as well. Just go ahead and do that. But all I'm saying is, an invitation alone is not enough. Okay? This is not just about getting people to church. This is about helping people take their next step towards Jesus Christ. And you are making a conscious decision to be a disciple that represents Jesus to the people that are in your life. How many are on that? How many say, well, I'm on that? Amen. 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 And... Um, this coming Saturday, this coming Saturday, we're having a block party at the town center. And I want to tell you, it's going to be, it's going to be awesome. All of the, if you have a church t-shirt, put it on. If you don't have one, that's fine. Uh, when you come, be prepared to have a conversation with somebody. You can hand out drinks. You can pray with people or you can just have, you know, just have a talk with someone else. And, and of course, we're going to have flyers there that we can pass out. Um, and the flyer for this Saturday is also in your worship guide. You can use that to invite somebody. And then, of course, on Easter Sunday, we'll have our Easter service. I want to make sure that everyone here is planning to be, on Easter, uh, to be in church on Easter Sunday. Every Christian should go to church on Easter because that's the day we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And finally, I want to tell you, we have some opportunities for you on Easter Sunday to serve. Okay, here's what I want you to do. There's going to be two services on Easter Sunday, 9.45 and 11.15, and we need help. We need your help. Uh, you can help in any way you want to, as small or as big you want, as you want to. We'll let you determine how much you can help. But here's what I want you to do. In order for us to know if you can help and we can schedule you, I want you to go ahead and pull out your Connect card in your worship guide right now. Everyone who wants to do this, pull it out. Here's what I want you to do. If you're available to serve anywhere, you say, okay, I can do anything. I can move chairs. I can stand in the front door and greet people. Whatever you want me to serve, I'll, I'll do that. If, you, if that's you, put your name down and write the letter A. Letter A at the top of your worship guide. Write the letter A. A stands for anywhere. I'll serve, I'll serve anywhere. Right? Do that quick. Number two, you say, well, I, I don't know I can serve anywhere, but I can help break down at the end of the second service. I can help take down all the things and help pack up. If that's you, you help break down. You want to put down letter B, stands for breakdown. I can help break down. Put down letter B. All right? And then here's the big one. Here's another one. Well, I can help with children's church. I can help back at the children's church. Maybe I can attend one service and serve at the other service or, or serve in one service and attend the other service. And I can do something at the children's church 
put down letter C for children's church. All right? And after we pray and we close, just walk up to the back and drop it in the offering bucket or at the info table or one of our tables there and we will reach out to you this week. Make sure you put your contact information so we can reach you and we can give you all the rest of the information. And then together we can serve and make Easter a great celebration. Let's pray. So Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning um, that you have called us. First, you called us from darkness. You called us to light. You called us from hopelessness. You called us to hope. You called us from outside of God's family and you brought us into your family. And today, you're calling us to be co-laborers, to workers with you. You're calling us to be witnesses. God, we open our hearts to you. We ask you to move in our hearts. And this morning, God, if there be anybody here who does not know Jesus personally, they've not yet experienced the love and the forgiveness that's come from his death and his resurrection, God, I pray that right now they'll open their hearts to Jesus and say yes to Jesus. So friends, as our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, if you're here this morning and you have never said yes to Jesus, I think I'll be wrong to close this service without giving you an opportunity to do so. And right in your seat, you can say yes to Jesus in your heart. And if you're doing that, would you please repeat this prayer with me? Say, Lord Jesus, today I say yes to you. I invite you into my heart to be my Lord and my Savior and to forgive me of all my sins and to write my name in the book of life. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, church. Give the Lord a hand of praise for that this morning. Woo! Yes. Amen. Listen, if you prayed that prayer with me and maybe it's the first time or maybe you've prayed it before and you're renewing it, that, that prayer again, there are a few things that I want you to know. Your next step, what you can do is to uh, text the word CONNECT to the number 713-677-2341. You're going to get a form, a link to a form. Kindly fill that form out. Or you can use the CONNECT card that is in your worship guide and just indicate on the back of the card, I said yes to Jesus. If you do that, we're going to send you out a book this week, and uh, we're going to help you in your next step with God. If you're here and you want to be baptized, hey, I got good news for you. We're having baptism in two Sundays from now, on Easter Sunday. Please indicate on your Connect card that you want to be baptized, and we're going to get information to you. And finally, tomorrow evening is our Connect 1.0 class, and this is for those who want to know more about our church family, if you want to be connected, you want to know more about our mission, our vision, our values, and our strategies, we invite you to sign up. You can sign up using the, the Connect card, but you can also go online, go on the next steps, and click on Connect Classes, and sign up that way. You're going to get a link and, uh, and the material for the class for tomorrow. All right. Somebody blessed this morning. Did somebody get something out of this this morning? Yes. All right, would you please stand to your feet? All right, turn to somebody next to you and just look at them and tell them, it was so good to worship with you this morning. Yes, it was good to worship with you this morning. And now may the Lord God bless you and make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord God give you peace in all your ways. In Jesus' name, and everyone say, Amen. Amen. You are dismissed.